What is going on, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the I Formation Podcast. Here with Ben Hall, my guy Leron McLean. Today we're bringing on a special guest, but before we bring on Malik, how you doing today, Leron? Man, I'm good, man. Can't complain. A little hungover for the game last night. Bad, bad, my loss, but uh, we'll get over that, man. Let's get into this interview with Malik, Go dogs, man. man. Go dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go with that. Here we go. Here we go. And, bro, and I'm, I'm from crazy. Bama, and I'm from Bama, but go dogs, man. For real, what part of Bama are you from? Mobile. Mobile, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know exactly where you at. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's an Auburn That's fan, it. though. So you feel me? The double dip of Auburn and Georgia got it. Got it. Oh, oh man. man. <laughs> so you shoot that right. Oh, man. He already is. He already is Georgia, man. You got it. Oh, man. <laughs> the, worst, the worst of both worlds. <laughs> hey, man. You know, just got to get the Falcon <laughs> turned around, man. And Georgia won't be that yeah. bad of a state. I'm telling you, bro. I'm telling you. I'll tell you, they might, they, George, Georgia, the Bulldogs might broke the curse last night, so. They probably broke the curse. I hope Atlanta get oh, rebound, you know what I'm saying, next year and come do their thing next year in that, in that Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Yeah, they're going to take the stadium from Atlanta and they don't start re- winning. For real. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. So, so now, now, now uh, we'd like to welcome on Malik. As you guys just heard, we were bringing on Malik Rozier, former Miami quarterback. Um, and and h- how you doing today, Malik? I'm doing good, man. You know, just loving life, uh, living the dream. Um, love what I'm doing, so definitely glad to be on this podcast. Appreciate you guys for having me on. Yes, sir. Man, appreciate you coming on, man. Real yeah. talk. Appreciate you coming on. For real. Um, but but just to start, I'll start off early. Um, coming out of high school, you know, you're a four star dual threat quarterback. Uh, from like you said, Mobile, Alabama. What made you want to go to Miami? And overall, what what made you choose Miami? Well, actually, I was a three star, not a four. Wish I was a four. But, okay, sorry, um, sorry. No, nah, you're not. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> But no, yeah, I was a three star. Um, so my dad was a big Miami fan. Um, I remember my really my first college <clears throat> college game um, was Miami versus Florida. No, Miami versus Florida State. It was actually when um, Jacory Harris threw the touchdown, like in the the left hand corner of the end zone. Um, and it was actually the that that was the first time that we well the last time we beat them since I beat Florida State. So I just remember that game, and then I was always like, I want to go to Miami, like, because I remember like seeing the crowd like erupt and and, and just signs of crowd. And I just saw like the energy and passion that my dad had. Obviously, like when you see your father being happy about a team, you're like, well, I want to make my dad that happy too. Um, so yeah, once I got the offer from Miami, and and James Coley really flew down to see me. Um, it was pretty much done, and the fact that they're one of the only schools that would let me play both baseball and football. So you know, I had like other schools, like I went to Bama, mm-hmm. and then like Saban talked to me, and I went to like Ole Miss. Um, and a lot of them wanted me to play strictly football and Miami was one of the few schools that was saying, yeah, I can play both baseball and football. So it was a huge opportunity for me as well, just because when I was in baseball, um, I did some team USA stuff. Um, I even had like a couple MLB teams contact me. So I knew baseball, I I had a little bit of uh, passion behind that. So I definitely wanted to see where it took me, at least in the college route Miami offered that to me. Now hearing you play baseball is awesome. I was reading up on that. You know, I play baseball at junior college here in Baltimore, but so take me through your freshman year. You went to, from what I was reading, you went to the College World Series, right? Yeah. So I actually didn't get to travel because, oh, when, yeah, I know it sucked. So the College World Series happened and we actually had spring ball, like spring practice during the College World mm. Series. So I wasn't able to travel. Um, but that, I mean, that team was great. I definitely learned a lot. Um, I mean, I still talk to some of those guys off that, that, that baseball team. Yes, so that's awesome. But now moving on into your as your college career went on, on, you know. Hold on, man. Let me let me oh, ask you yeah, this. You what, 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 what high school did you go to in uh, Mobile? So I went to a private school called Faith Academy. Right. Faith yeah, Academy, okay, actually, okay. Yeah, they're actually so we're actually really good in football, um, and baseball. Actually, we I think yeah. last year or two years ago we won state in baseball, and then last year we won. It was either last in the last two years we've won state in both baseball and football. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, our football program is we've both been taken off. But yeah, we're five A. So I mean, we play like all the big schools, St. Paul's. Viger, LaFleur, like we play all the, the, the big power schools in, in Mobile. So, so so did you get did you get a lot of, you know what I'm saying, ref from the community for not going to Alabama or Auburn, being from the state of Alabama? Did you get a lot of from people around you or like fans or, you know what I'm saying, people in your school or whatever? Not really. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I mean, most of the people around me were just happy that I was going to college, you feel me? Because okay, yes, you don't sir, know, yes, like, like I'm from, so I'm from really, like, I was born in, not born, but I was raised in Violet Battery, which is like the swamp, like right, right on the Gulf of Mexico. So it was just like, <clears throat> for me to make it out of the bayou to Mobile, then from Mobile to Miami, it was just like, I was just happy to be there. Like, if you were going to hate, that was on me. Like, I wasn't going to even let you in my circle. 
So it was just like, yeah, the people around me were definitely supporters. I had more people wanting to pull me towards Southern Miss. It was actually where Todd Munkin was, which is what brings a relationship later on with that. Um, oh, but man, yeah, Todd Munkin was there. I really liked Todd. And I, and I actually was going to commit to Southern Miss. A lot of people knew it. And then I wound up flipping to Miami last minute. Um, so a lot of people were kind of upset more about that because Southern Miss is really close to my home, like my little sister and stuff. But outside yeah. of that, I mean, most people were definitely happy that I was going to Miami for sure. So, so the atlas, I know that was probably a big, you know what I'm saying, like change from going from Mobile down to, you know what I'm saying, what, the 305 <laughs> down to Miami, you know what I'm saying, for college or freshman year, man. How was that, man? Talk about that. Um, yeah, it was crazy. I, I remember, like, honestly, I was always out. It was wild. <laughs> Um, because honestly, like you don't, you don't know nobody. And that's the biggest thing. Like, like it happens freshman year. See, like you don't know anybody, especially if you try to like mobile to Miami. Like I didn't know anyone in the city. It was either like go out or be at home by myself. And so like, mm-hmm. naturally I went out with the boys, but it also helped too, because I was able to create like real chemistry because I had to be around all the football players. So it was the only people I knew, you feel me? So, um, freshman year was a lot of fun, met a lot of great connections that like, I'm still close with like David Njoku, Chris Herndon, Braxton Berrios, but all that started like my freshman year whenever we had no choice because we didn't know anyone else, but to all go out together. So yeah, it definitely yeah. was a unique experience that, that carried over for many years. Indeed. You going there? So, so now while you were at Miami, you know, the 2017 season was by far your best, you know, at, at one point, you know, it was looking like you could win the Heisman. T- take me through what that, that season was like for you. Oh man, um, <laughs> that that season was a very wild season. Um, you know, just because we were number two, and like I mean, they, like I remember times I would literally go on dates and I would have like servers and like waiters stop me and like ask me like what was our game plan for the week, especially like the Notre Dame week. Whenever we had Notre Dame, I I couldn't even go out to dinner. I went out to dinner twice, like Monday and Tuesday. And I got harassed both times by people that, like, knew me because obviously everyone was pumped about the game. And, uh, I mean, it was definitely a different environment. But, I mean, I think what really hurt me a lot, and like I mentioned earlier, I, I know the, the podcast wasn't important, but I, when I played UNC, I, I really did hurt my shoulder. Um, and so I remember, like, obviously we were up being number two, but it was definitely, like, a, a tough road. Like, I was up every morning at 5.30 in the morning. I was at treatment by 6 a.m. I was in treatment yeah. for an hour, then went to breakfast, then went to class, then went back to more treatment. Like, there was even days to where, like, my body was in so much pain that I couldn't pick up a football. So I didn't practice for the entire week and then still played on Saturday. Um, so, I mean, definitely the road to getting to where I got was not easy. Um, I mean, it was probably one of the most, I would say, physically tough battle just because I had, like, minor nicks. Like, my knee was swollen. My, I rolled my ankle twice. My shoulder was messed up. I, I pulled my hamstring three times. It was just like throughout the entire season, it was always like rehab, get better, rehab, get better. Um, but I mean, it was definitely fun. I learned a lot and, I, and I'm able to like use that experience to now help other kids out because um, I do quarterback training now, which which is something that I, that I love to do. So that season definitely gave me a lot of experience and insight on to have one, how to be successful, but two, like how hard it is and, 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 and what it takes to actually win consistently. So, so, so now, now following your, your career at Miami, um, you know, you signed a, or you agreed to a, a deal of rookie camp with the Dolphins. Tell me, take me through what that was a little bit like during that spring. That yeah, spring that was a lot of fun. You know, I I loved Brian Flores. Unfortunately, he got fired. But personally, I love. Oh the guy, my God, know. bro! I was I was crazy, not, not to cut you off, like, not to cut you off, man. But that's crazy. I'm not even support the Dolphins. I can't even support them no more. Me either, bro. Me either. Me either, man. That, that was crazy. Him. Yeah, I mean, no, I loved Coach Flores, man. He was real. I remember I was actually one of only like three or four people that after the camp ended that he sat down with, like he had all of us in like a, a little cafeteria and he was in there for about 30 minutes and he called about three of us and three or four of us. He sat us down and he talked and he was like, man, I really like you. Definitely want you to keep getting better. Um, but he wanted me, he was like, I need more film. I want you to keep like, um, yeah, basically keep getting better. And then that's when I went to Pensacola. And when I was out there, they basically told me that I had a whole bunch of like damage and fluid in my right shoulder and that, I could play through it, but it would be a lot of problems that it was better to get surgery to get all the fluid drained out and, and get all that scar tissue um, correct. And I just didn't want to go through all that. Obviously, like it was like, okay, then I got to go through rehab. Then I go to the Canadian League. Then I got to hope that like my shoulder doesn't get messed up in the Canadian League so I can make it back to the league. And it was just something that like it was too much. And that's kind of where I fell into like the coaching world, which is kind of where I'm at now. So I, was, was, was that, was that like, uh, how was, I mean, you know, so I know I, I did with my own, you know what I'm saying? Mentally stuff. How was that for, for you mentally? Like going through that, like actually going into a camp, then 
them saying like, you know what I'm saying, get a little bit better than you trying to get better than, than they tell you that about your shoulder. Yeah, no, it's definitely hard. Um, I mean, it was something that I knew my shoulder was messed up from like the middle of my junior season, but I didn't, I didn't think it was that bad. Um, and it was just one of those things to where I really had to pick whether I was going to mentally take myself through that each and every day to battle, which it isn't a bad option. But my thing was, is if I was going to do it for the NFL, because they were like, Hey, like we want to give you a rookie shot. That's different than me saying, Hey, I want to go get surgery. Then go to the, then go to Canadian, then hope to make it to the league. So it was just a lot more to process. And I was just like, man, like my body's always hurting. Like I, I don't, mm -hmm. the, I, obviously money comes and goes. You feel me? Like there's a million yep. ways to make money. It's just like, Thanks. do I want to consistently take my mind and my body through all this pain to hope that I can live out a dream that, Honestly, like 1% of the whole entire like population ever gets to even come close to living. So it was just like the odds and, and just like my passion was really into like helping kids grow and, and people getting better, which is why now I do what I do. Okay. Okay. So, I understand that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You go ahead, Ben. So, so then following, um, following that, uh, you were on staff in Miami. We kind of just talked before the podcast, but I guess take me through a little bit what that was like for you. Yeah, your coaching. Yeah. How you got into how you got into the coaching? You just I I I could tell that you love the game. So coaching yeah, is no, part I of it. Yeah, love the game, man. Like that. <laughs> like I'm very I'm very passionate. It's funny because I've had a couple people actually offer me like basically six k. Well, a little little less than like eighty to hundred k to literally stop coaching and like work for them and do other stuff. And I was like, man, like money's not about this. Like this is something that I'm I'm genuinely passionate about. Um. So yeah, after after the Dolphins, I went on staff in Miami. Um. I mean, it was okay. Um. I mean. At the time, honestly, we were severely at the, at the, at the you Excuse me, I mean, no, no, I was with the Hurricanes. So after the okay, 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 Hurricanes, and I was okay, on the okay, staff. And uh, I mean, long story short, I was there, um, wasn't very happy, didn't like it. Literally, by the end of it, I was working both sides, basically by myself. I was the only intern there working. I worked for free at that. Um, oh man, I understand. Yeah, that. no, you feel me? So I was working by myself, <laughs> and then to be honest with you. The job that I stayed there worked for for free that like Manny told me that I needed or like that I had to do was go through the recruiting world. He gave to someone else that didn't have to go through what I went through. So then what mm. I wound up doing was I wound up leaving going to Georgia. And honestly, like I love Georgia, man. I I, I still wish I was up there to some sense. Um, I mean, they paid me and that was one thing, too. Like it wasn't much, but at least they were like, hey, man, like you're going to contribute. They paid me. Um, obviously, like I said earlier, I was going to recruit the Todd Monkey and he wound up becoming the OC at Georgia. So when I was on staff, I was his direct recruiter. Um, and I mean, just because of the relationship that we had in high school and him knowing me, um, he let me in all the meetings. So any of the offensive meeting, the tidy meeting, the quarterback, like I, I was really able to sit in there and learn how coaches think. And obviously I understand game planning, but like when I was there at Georgia, I was spending hours on hours on game planning, watching film. And it was just a whole different world that I had to learn. And, and I just, like, I'm honestly very thankful for Georgia because they've taught me like so much stuff from like the coaching aspect to like how like, I mean, me and Monkey was sitting there for three hours. And I was just asking, like, what do you see in this guy? Like, what do you look for? So now I know exactly what NFL guys look for because that's what he was. Before Georgia, he was with the Cleveland Browns. So it's like yeah, yeah. I was really able to dive in and pick their brain. And when I was at Miami, I was basically, like, excommunicated. Like, I stayed in, like, this little room. I couldn't go to any of the meeting rooms. I When I went to practice, people made an issue about it. So I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, man. Um, but, yeah, so go dogs, like I said. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. I know that was a, I know. So do you feel like just being on the monkey, you feel like, do you feel, do, are you, are you going um, for yourself? Are you going to get into like the coach role as an OC or, you know what I'm saying? I, I know you're coaching uh, quarterbacks on the, you know what I'm saying? Doing your thing, yeah. but yeah, you so, ever thought about getting into the OC role? Yeah. So I, so I thought about it. Um, that's definitely something that I would love to do. But my biggest thing is that, so after being in the coaching world, I learned a lot. So yeah. there's honestly like, really three types of coaches. There are coaches that are developmental guys. There are coaches that are really good at recruiting. And then there are coaches that are good at all that are, that are good at both. And most of the time, most coaches can't do both. They're either really good at development and they're terrible at recruiting or they're yeah. great recruiters and they're terrible at development. So my thing is, is I feel like I'm kind of using this quarterback country and, and, and what I do now to understand quarterbacks, especially for the younger generation, because the generation has changed from mine to now just how yeah. kids are and how they respond to stuff. So it's like, I kind of want to use this to understand more of the recruiting world, getting one-on-one -on -one connections. Then from there, the developmental side. So I want to be able to say, hey, I took this 12-year-old and developed him into a D1 quarterback. I took this mm -hmm. eight-year-old and developed yeah, So I'm understanding both aspects to when I say, hey, like I have eight years of me developing multiple D1 quarterbacks 
And that was my biggest thing because I had coaches that could literally explain any type of coverage. They can do any type of breakdown. But, like, when I was throwing, it was wrong. They'd be like, oh, that's a bad ball. Well, obviously, everyone can tell me it's a bad ball. But tell me, hey, your weight wasn't back. Hey, your head wasn't full. Hey, your elbow dropped. Hey, like you weren't rotating. It's just different things like that that I've yeah. learned. After, you know, David Morrison, guys, that if I was ever become an OC, I would be able to tell each quarterback, like, what he's doing wrong and how we can mm-hmm. fix it. And there's not many guys that are good at recruiting and can develop. And so that's my biggest thing is that I know I'm good at recruiting. I know I, I, I know how to find talent. I know how to talk to kids. But now I want to sit down and really take time to learn how to develop kids one-on-one and be able to help these kids not only mentally but, like, physically become the best quarterback they can be. So Oh, that's, that's dope, bro. That's, yeah. that's awesome, man. So, no, I still like that's awesome. playbook, and I still go through their plays, and I'll even, like, yeah. I'll even, like, draw out plays. And, I, and I, it's, it's funny because when I watch games, like, I'll listen to them, like, okay, like, if he's going to throw the fade to the left, he's dumb, and he'll throw a fade to the left for a touch. I'm like, thank you. So, like, offense is, like, and scheming up plays is definitely on my mind a lot, which is why I love what I do. Because a lot of times, whenever I say, hey, it's a drag route, like I say, hey, you're not going to go one, two, three, throw the drag. No, you're going, like, fade to corner now down to your drag or your check down. So, I really make these kids see concepts as they throw single routes. Um, okay. So, I try to do my best to integrate as much concept-based stuff into my um, quarterback development. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You on, Ben? <laughs> So yeah, so so I was gonna ask a little bit about that. Um, how did you get into the the quarterback the, the quarterback country coaching? I know you do it in Central Florida. How did you get into that? So um, actually, I got lucky. So a lot of people don't know that I didn't really start playing quarterback until my junior year in high school. Like I was never a quarterback. I was a running back and a safety. So we actually had a guy named uh, Chris Casher went to Florida State, um, and he was from Mobile. He went to my high school, and I remember when Saban came out. Um, I was like a six foot five eleven freshman, so I was big. You feel me? Like I was, I, I, I was a starting safety for for my high school team, and and I remember like Saban recruited me a little bit. He talked to me. That's actually how whenever I became a quarterback, I me and Saban had that same connection because he knew me from my freshman year. Um, and I just remember from there, like I played safety, didn't like it, caught too many stingers, moved to quarterback, and then the guy named David Morris reached out to me. So David was actually the the founder of QB Country, so it's based in Mobile. Um, we're actually doing our first like QB country senior bowl collaboration where we're doing like a whole QB country camp around it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, after I got out of coaching, I just remember that I wanted to develop quarterbacks. I knew that David was one of the best guys that I've ever been around, at least developing guys. Like we have like Mac Jones, Davis Mills, Daniel Jones, we Stetson Bennett. He's with us. We have Jake Fromm. Um, we are also partnering with Eli Payton and uh, Philip Rivers. So, like, the list goes on and on. We have Archie Manning. We have Jaden Davis. Like, oh, the, man. You, you feel what I mean? Like, the pipeline <laughs> is like, like it, it's crazy. Like, I think that most, like, we have good talent in the league. Don't get me wrong. Like, Mac Jones, Davis feels great. But I feel like most of our talented kids, that ones that are really going to blow up, or like our younger, like, 2023, 2024 kids. Um, and just after seeing that and being around guys like Buster Faulkner, who is the QB coach at Georgia, like, he loves David. So um, after talking to multiple coach, coaches, they love the way QB country was ran. And my thing was, is that if you look at quarterbacks, especially like in the top 50, there's not many from the state of Florida. There's really not. Mm-hmm. But if you look at yeah. any positions, running backs, receivers, DBs, we're all over there. You know what I mean? We probably have yeah. four in the top 10. And it's mm-hmm. just like, it's crazy because when you think about a quarterback nowadays, it's really taking an athlete and teaching them yeah. fundamentals. That, that, that's really it. Fundamentals in the game. And, and you let their athletic ability on the scramble drills and, the wild arm angles, that's just athletic God-given ability. Obviously, you can coach it and correct it, but it's just like for Florida to have all these crazy athletes and not have at least three or four kids every year in the top 20 is just crazy to me. So that's kind of where I come down and, and like, I'm trying to change that to say, hey, like, if you're athletic, even if you're not, like, I can help you to have the right fundamentals to where college coaches will say, hey, like, you've been taught, right? Like, I can now have you become one of my quarterbacks. So that's like the biggest thing that I've been learning um, to do because I see a lot of kids that they have arm talent, but their footwork is, is off. Like, they're Two step mm-hmm. in a, a, a 14 yard comeback. Like, that's not going to work. And so it's like teaching Thanks. these kids right footwork. It's like your feet have to match up with their route. Like, your timing in your head has to be the correct route because you got to understand, too. Like, and this is the biggest thing for me to learn. Like, if I have Amon Richards who runs a 4 4, run a slant, and I have Daryl Langham who runs a 4 8, the timing of my feet have to be completely different because their route, the speed of their route is completely different. Yes, so it's like teaching kids that too. Like even when kids go to camp, you hear them all the time. Oh man, like that kid's slow. Oh man, but like you have to know that. Like, I don't know what you're doing while you're waiting, but I'll be watching every receiver run their route to figure out who's fast and who's slow. So when I get up, like I know his speed, like y'all are worried about whatever you're worried about. So worry about like, what is your task? Like I got to throw this receiver. So let me gauge his speed on every rep, whether I'm throwing it or not. So it's teaching them tricks like that, or just tips like that. So where when they go to camp, they're more successful. Cause now I know, Hey, I got this big guy 
he's going to be slower so I can slow my feet down. Or, hey, I have this little short, fast kid. My feet need to be faster because he's going to get in and out of his break quicker. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just, like, small parts of the game that I, like, I try to help kids with. Oh, man, that's, that's, that's dope, man. That's dope. So let me ask you this. I know you was in the, queue, uh, in the, in the room with – so what was the deal with at Georgia with 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 with, with uh, Stanson and all the quarterbacks and him doing that and him not being a the man? They recruit somebody. It was like explain that to us, man. I know the world want to know that. <laughs> that. That part I don't really know um, because that was more between like Munkin and Kirby. Um, yeah. But I mean, I I I, I like both of them. I mean, JT and Stetson are, are definitely two different guys. Um, yeah. More of your pure like pocket passer, like he'll he'll try to scramble, but he's not. To me, Stetson is like your really savvy, um, undersized guy that just – I mean, he's legit a bulldog. Like, you know, like he's not hes not scared of anything. He'll get hit in the mouth, get up. Um, so, I mean, two different guys. I mean, JT's the same way. I mean, he's a great kid, smart kid. Um, mm-hmm. But, I mean, personally, I don't know. It's hard. I, I think that they're just they're, – they're just different gamers. Like, Stetson's more conservative, which he will take shots. JT's a guy that could throw seven touchdowns but also throw like three picks. So it's just like, <laughs> yeah. But it's not even that. It's not even from an arm talent. It's just that he's so confident in himself that like he's gonna try to fit a ball in a very tight window, and he might do it, but he might not. You feel me? It's just one mm-hmm. of those things. Yeah. Like he's very talented and he's very confident, but sometimes being overconfident in yourself can lead to you making mistakes. And I feel like that was the biggest difference between JT and Stetson. Obviously, Stetson might not have the arm talent that JT has from like distance, different things like that. But Stetson is also gonna preserve the ball and at, and at the end of the day when you have a good enough team like georgia or bama you want a kid that can make plays but you want someone also that's not gonna get you beat you feel me like you want someone gonna have most overs got get you in the right place at the right time so i mean that's i mean it's really about who you like more and, it, and it's not even it's more like an oc call like i can see both like honestly like if it was me i don't know who i would start <laughs> i was about to ask you that too i'm like who would you start <laughs> I mean, they're both great kids. It's not like one of them has a bad person. Like, I remember seeing JT. Like, I'd get up there at, like, 7 a.m., and JT's up there at 6.30 in the morning watching film. So, you feel me? They, they both work. So, it's like – it's not even, like, a work ethic. It's just, like, what type of quarterback do you like? Do you like a guy that's mm-hmm. going to – really big confidence and will throw it 70 yards every time just because he likes it, or you want a kid that's a little more conservative? So, it's just it's just your play style, really, which, I mean, they wind up being right. They pick Stetson. They want a natty. So, I mean, great call yeah. by you. Yeah, I'm about telling you. About time, Kirby. <laughs> I know. They, they were on my dog like they were on Mark Rick's head. They were on his head, so I'm glad he They was on his head, bro. They was on Kirby. I, I was so, I'm just, I was just so, no, I told you, anybody could be this man. I was just so, you know, Kirby, a uh, Belma guy. I'm just so happy for Kirby, man, in the squad, the way they, they just finished, man. Dan Stanson, his his story, you know what I'm saying? His story yeah. is a dope story, man. I literally told him, I was like, bro, if you're about 6'2", you'd be a first-rounder. I was like, they don't draft you first round because you're under six foot. Swear to God. Like, intelligence, work ethic, like, just timing, understanding IQ of football, like, he has all of it. The only knock on him is maybe arm strength and size. That's it. Yep, that's the only that's thing it, yeah. But anything outside of that, it's one of those guys that, like, he's going to make everyone around him better just because of his personality and who he is. So there's, like, a, a big charisma around Stetson, too, which is why – that's one reason why they chose him as well. Yeah, I think I see the team navigated towards them also. Like everybody got yeah. around them and was was yeah. supporting them and all that. So they they, they look good. Like when he started crying on the sideline, man, I was like, yeah. I'm happy for the kid, man. Boy, his whole family went to Georgia. You feel me? Like grandfather, mom, I mean, dad, mom, everyone. Like their Georgia bloodline. Period. And for him to win a national championship after him being a walk on, after him almost leaving last year because everyone thought JT was going to start. You know what I mean? Like that's that's a great storyline. I'm just, I mean, I'm just happy for Stetson. So same here. Go on, ben. So, so now, now to get into a little bit of Miami now, uh, we kind of talked a little bit right before the podcast started, but take me through kind of what your thoughts are on, on Mario Cristobal now being the head coach at Miami. Man, I love that Mario Cristobal is the head coach. One, because I think he's going to bring a form of physicality from the offensive standpoint. You know, I feel like over the last couple of years, like the defense has always been physical. When you come back from like my years, like I remember our defense was by far one of the best defenses out there. Um, but I think the one area that we have really lacked has definitely been like interior offense alignment and just tackles. I, I think we have one with, with, with Taylor. I know Navon's coming back. Um, but 
I just think that there there's a gap that we're missing on just a protection standpoint. Um, and I think that with Mario Crispo being an offensive line guy, being a specialist, he's really going to be able to give Nick Saban and Kirby Smart really big problems when it comes to getting these interior like offensive defense alignment. Um, and, and, and to me, just being at Georgia and even even being from Alabama, like I don't care where you are, and who you are. If you want to win in college football and even in the NFL, you win in the trenches. You feel me? Like yep. it has a skill position, but if you can't protect your running back and you can't protect your quarterback, who cares? You, you can't get the ball to him. And so it's just like, I think that that's going to change. And that's what's, that's what I've been wanting to change for the longest. Like Florida has the best skill player. Even if we don't get the number one kid in the city of Miami, the number two is probably almost just as good as him. You feel me? So it's like the skill players obviously want to come to Miami. We've always had the four and five star DBs, receivers, running backs, quarterbacks, but we haven't had a consistently five-star and four-star like offense alignment. And that's where I think that he's really going to change the culture, at least from like getting more like quarterbacks wanting to come to Miami. Cause I know that's been a big issue is like, well, if I go to Miami, if I got protected. And that, I mean, it was, it was true. Like Brad got banged up a lot. I got banged up a lot. Not even saying those guys weren't good. Cause there's plenty of guys that were in the league and they're, and they're, they're very good, but it's just like, there, there were a lot of gaps, especially like my year. Like I had a guard that was playing tackle. DJ Scaife. DJ Scaife was a guard mm. because we were so injured and people were out. We put a freshman guard at right tackle, which isn't fair to him. But it's like we didn't have depth of four and five stars consistently to where like, hey, like if our first starter goes down, we're good to have another kid come in. And you see that Georgia. Look at Broderick. Great kid. Great guy. Got yeah. his reps starting that championship. So it's like when you have depth and consistent depth at like D-line, offense line, it definitely helps you. And I, and I, and I think that's what he's going to change. Oh, this dope. I, uh, Chris Ball, when I heard Chris Ball was going down, I said, man, recruiting going to be better. The talent going to be up, man. They're going to be physical down there. He going back to his alma mater. And, like, just left, left a big school like Oregon coming down there. He going to change the program. So, I'm, I'm happy for it. I'm, I'm looking forward to Miami. The ACC is weak now, honestly. Yeah. The big dog Clemson is slowly falling apart. You know, we just yep. – we just their, um, their AD. Um, and I'm pretty sure their defensive coordinator just left and went to Oklahoma. Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma, yeah. Oklahoma. yep, 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 yep. It's like that team is about to completely rebuild. So it's really like, hey, over these next two years, which ACC school, whether it's Florida, I mean, whether it's Florida State, whether it's Clemson or whether it's us, like which team is going to rebuild? Because I think it's going to be a wild and interesting couple of seasons with seeing like which team comes on top. Because there's going to be a lot of teams that are back in their rebuilding stages of coaches leaving mm -hmm. and top players leaving and different things like that. So I, it was, it was, it was yeah. pitting uh, Wake Forest in a championship game, wasn't it? You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, told Bill, I, mean, like, I told Bill that I was like, is that the that's the ACC championship? That Man, that's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> Wake plays hard. They got a good quarterback. Their quarterback, I like their yeah. quarterback. Both quarterbacks from Wake and and uh Pitt. Both yeah. both both good QBs. But just from like a talent and recruiting standpoint, like you would think that like Clemson or Miami or Florida State, like one of those guys that teams that have consistent four and five stars, but no, it's like blue collar teams like Pit that just they're gonna take yeah. their three stars and they're gonna work them and they're gonna work them and yeah. then flip up and let them play around they're gonna beat you yeah and so that I think that yeah it's 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 crazy but I'm definitely excited to see like what Miami can do over these next couple of years because I, I I mean I think think the coastal and the ACC period is both wide open for the taking so yep yep I agree yeah so you know so mean? so I mean we we've, we've kind of bashed him on this podcast so I just kind of want to see what your thoughts are with the national or the NIL stuff. We think it's awesome. It's great. Um, but Davo Sweeney, you kind of just talked about Clemson a little bit. Davo Sweeney has been very horrendous about that, talking about that. What are your opinions on uh, Davo Sweeney? Because we know you're ACC quarterback. Um, <laughs> I think Davo's a good guy. I think he's a very interesting guy. I know at Georgia, not at Georgia, but at Clemson, he um, kind of makes like a cult around like his recruits yeah. and everything. I think it's very weird. But, hey, if it works <laughs> for you, it's the, the kids commit to it, then, hey, that's – that's your thing, but I mean, personally, does he not like NILs? Uh, he's been like yeah. very outspoken on coaches. Been against be the only yeah, yeah. He's been it's like he going yeah. to. They say they say he going to the living room and 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 he not people not coming to school for your science program, Dabo. <laughs> they come to Clemson to play football. Like that what he yeah. thinks. Oh, they, they, these kids not even choosing school anymore. Yeah. Like, come on, Dabo, be real. <laughs> no, but he's. I mean, wrong, wrong, and right. I think that I think there is a yeah. fine. I think the NCAA does need to set like a cap, whether it is like two million, um, whatever yeah. it is, because I think it's going to get outrageous. Like they were talking about Caleb Williams having a school, uh, Eastern, Eastern Michigan, Michigan. Yep. Yep. a million dollars. Yeah, 
just, 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 yeah. Charlie Batch. What up, Charlie Batch? Yeah, with Batch. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've seen Batch. that. And they talking about he might he might get in the transfer portal and go to uh, Georgia. Well, yeah. they, well, no, I think USC I think now. Caleb's gonna go to USC. Yeah, because yeah. the freshman Ooh. transferred. So I think that's where he's and gonna there's go. He's gonna throw him money. Yeah. So USC gonna throw like, so much money. That's crazy. crazy. Well, I mean, like, so we have Archie. Like they were talking about Archie's NIL deal being over like five million, just because of who his parents. You know what I mean? Just because of family with with the last name Manning. Like, imagine all like the cool commercials you can do with like paid Eli Archie. Jeez. You feel me? And then then, then oh there's big God. Archie. Yeah. So it's just like some of these kids NIL deals, and I think basketball is gonna be the same way. Like some yeah. of these big basketball yeah. kids that I yeah. mean. So I think they're gonna for sure have to put a cap, and I and I. And I think a lot of these schools need to be held responsible with like money management. Like if if your kid yes, signs yes. over a six figure deal, you need to have someone that sits down with them, whether it's once a month, twice a month, but teach them, hey, this is your income, this is your money management. Like these are things you have to do. Like teach them how to become an actual businessman and manage their money, not like get a hundred k and then they blow all this money. And then they don't understand taxes because when money you receive, you get taxed on. So it's like the colleges need to be held responsible for these kids as well. Um, so I think it's a it needs to be a balance between the NCAA and colleges really like letting these kids obviously get paid, but don't make it to where you're handing these 18 year old kids two or three million dollars and expecting them to financially do everything that's right with it. So and you know and you know they're not. It's just they're like, not, they're just yeah, like, I mean, you couldn't expect me to. If I get out buying cars, <laughs> houses, all that, you feel, but like that's not where you want to go. You need to teach these kids how to invest for the long term. Saying, hey, like if you got hurt, like what would you do after? And it's like, yeah, that's yes. where like I wish colleges would get more involved, which is something that I'm trying to do. I'm actually meeting with the university, but um, we're trying to bring this whole like you network thing involved where like I have a big group of business partners that are basically like, hey, we want to take all the Miami grads that didn't go to the NFL. We want to offer them jobs, like real jobs saying, hey, like in two years, you'll make over six figures if you stay by this course. Mm. And that's stuff that, like, I'm trying to help the university, and we're trying to do stuff to where um, we're working with the Topple Center to do, like, a $100,000, like, business idea. So it's like, hey, you take a four-month course. You don't have to go to every session, but we'll have guys from, like, the music industry, auto, um, NFTs, um, influencers, brand development, all these different categories. You pick a couple, and it help you, uh, like, build out your business plan. And then from there, the best business idea, we'll give you $10,000 that you can put in a savings so that you can slowly develop that business as you become an athlete. Mm. And just teaching kids that they're more than an athlete, you feel me? Because, yeah, like, yeah. that that was something that, like, I'm learning all, like, real-world, like, business stuff now. And while I'm doing a business, when I should have been learning that in Miami, and I feel like kids have a bad concept right. saying, hey, if, if, if I'm not – if I didn't go to the business school, I can't be a businessman, which is very false. And I think that's what happens is that, like, if you don't go to the business school, they don't teach you the day-to-day stuff that you need to do from, like, task management to, like, tedious stuff that, like, the colleges should teach all athletes, period. Because, like, technically, you are your own business now. You know what I mean? These NIL deals, you got to construct yourself like a business because that's what you are. Um, and so I hope that that's something that I'm trying to help these college kids with, especially at the University of Miami. And that would be a dope program, man. I'm looking yeah, forward to so, that. <laughs> yeah, that. No, so, we're, we're, so, yeah, the idea actually came from Mark Rick. Mark Rick actually had it running um, prior, and then when he left, he kind of let it fall off. Um, and so I'm trying to revive it, but just building it kind of a different way and just more engaging, you know what I mean? Like, there was a network of people there, but it wasn't like, hey, like, here's $10,000 for the best idea. What I'm like, man, if you're giving me money, like, now I'm really going to take my time and focus on it because yeah. if I'm diligent, there's a way for me to now put – my whole time and effort and energy into something that can make a reality. So I think it's a little different way of like teaching these kids that, that you can be a successful businessman, even if you do or don't make it in football, because at some point football ends, the average football career is three years. So it's just like you, by the time you're 28 years old, you're out of the league. What you going to do now? Mm-hmm. Seriously. I'm you, everybody got this. So I got my stories. I got my stories. You feel I got me? Like, it, but people yeah, don't understand that. And the problem is, is people not brutally honest with these kids. Like, okay, even yeah. if you do make it to the league three or four years and you're out, if you make it a five, you, you, you yeah, feel me? It's just yeah. like that. Why I say I thank God for about seven. You know what I'm saying? But some guys, some I know a few guys. Some guys go two to three years for they had that fourth year thing, and now they they on the outside looking in. They played this whole season. They still trying to figure out. I'm trying to get their mind ready, like and start the transition right now mentally. You exactly. know what I'm saying? To get you ready, just in case, just in case you, uh, just in case you don't go back. You know what I'm saying? Let's, yeah, and, let's and to me, sometimes it's hard by then, especially to make it to the league because their whole life since they've been like four years yeah. old to 25 is only been football, and that's the biggest thing. That, like I want to teach these kids: take 90 percent of your time and 
focus on school and football, then take 10% of time and focus on yourself and like what you want to be outside of a football player. And then even if it's not like once a week, but slowly figure out what you want to do. So if you get hurt, like I had Amon Richards, Amon Richards was, was a freshman all American, was supposed to get drafted first round, hurt his neck. This guy's a marketing genius. You know what I mean? He made his own company, <laughs> sold his own company, but it's like, Amon's always thought differently. It's like teaching these kids that even if you don't make it in football, there's still ways for you to make six figures and become a millionaire. And then that's really what we're trying to develop where whether you make it to the league or not, like you're going to become successful just because you're at the University of Miami. That's dope. <laughs> yeah. So. Keep going, man. That's dope. Right. That's dope. Yeah, yeah. So so now yeah, that, that is awesome. But um, so now my last question before I'm finished, uh, kind of getting uh, into back into Miami. Um, What are your – how long do you think it'll take before Crystal Ball can get them back to the top of the ACC? I don't think it takes long at all. I mean, I think, honestly, I project us to win the ACC Coastal, and I think that the only team that might give us a little bit of fits if they make it will be Clemson talent base-wise. I mean, obviously, Florida State game is going to be close just because it's a rivalry, you know what I mean? Look at Alabama. Yeah, no matter what the talent is, the coaching, that game is always yeah. going to be good. Um, but, I mean, outside of that, like, I mean, most of I, – I think most of our conference is pretty weak just from, like, a recruiting standpoint and from, like, a – I don't say coaching, but obviously I think that Miami's resume of coaching can stack up against anyone's. Yeah. Um, so I think that we'll have talent and coaches that can really help these kids develop. So, I mean, I, I'm shooting for the ACC. I mean, I think that we'll wind up somewhere inside the top ten this year, honestly. I mean, I, I, I do. You got a good quarterback. A lot of our talent last year were young talent receivers, line – um, Tyreek Stevenson and um, the tackle both said they're coming back this year. So I just think that there's a lot of good charisma and energy. We changed the weight room staff. I, I, I don't know much about the last coach. I know a lot of the kids did like Feely. Um, I know he was a great guy, but I know this this other guy is like one of those viral, like the guy with the big mustache. I don't yeah, know his name. Yeah, but yeah. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm actually excited to meet him because he actually has me pumped to go work out down there. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm real. Real. like I want to, yeah, you're I want to bring in that mentality. Yeah, yeah like you feel yeah. me? Like that's contagious, and it's just like having those kind of people makes me want to go back and play now. And like I haven't had that feeling in a while, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely excited for the guys down there. And I can tell just by the older guys staying that they definitely feel the same because that's what you can tell. You know what I mean? Like, like my senior year, I remember when like all four of the linemen for Clemson all stayed. And that's a culture thing. You feel me? Yeah, like yeah. You know, those guys all could have left and went first, second round if they wanted to. But whenever you love the culture, you love the staff, like the older guys stay. And just by seeing guys like Tyreek and him stay, it just tells you that like they love the culture that's being developed there. Dope, dope, dope. So, man, if, if, if you, if you if we'll take your time and get into, you know what I'm saying, your, I, I, is it a nonprofit or is it your company? Oh, yeah. This, kid, this one? Right here, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. All right. So this one, this company is called Kiddo Kinetics. Um, so it's a, it's basically a mobile, um, fitness program for kids. So we teach kids basically from six months all the way up to twelve years old, and it kind of bridges the gap because most of the kids that I get from football are like twelve all the way up to the college NFL level. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if you guys know. Um, previously, the biggest problem with kids was childhood obesity. So yeah. the kids getting big. Um, now what it is, is mental health issues, anxiety, depression, but a lot of that comes from kids, not one, not having PE teachers because now in these daycare and preschools, they don't have enough because I don't know if you guys, guys know a lot of the teachers are on strike and, and they yeah. don't want to teach. So the PE teachers are cut down as well as some of these schools don't offer like after school programs. And so what happens is these kids, they go to school all day, they learn, they get home at like three or four. And then what do they do all day? They do their homework and then they look on YouTube, Twitter, whatever type of social media that yeah. they're on or video games and it's like they have no way to like if they're maybe they're mad what do they do like they like i see my cousin my cousin gets mad he runs in his room he just sticks to his phone and doesn't talk and it's like yeah. i mean when i was when i got mad i went outside and threw rocks and ran around and, you know what i mean i, I, yeah, I, yeah, I like yeah, let go yeah, of that right. energy and it's like the fact that these kids don't know how to like let go of the energy they it, it, it stores up in their body and it has mental health effects so that's one of the main reasons that i'm doing this just because there's a lot of um, draw, a, attention drawn to mental health and it, especially on the, on the development side, it has on like younger kids with just not being active. So me, I'm obviously a sports guy. So, I mean, we teach kids over 18 plus sports. I mean, volleyball, basketball, lacrosse, Frisbee. Um, and we like bring a new sport out each week. Um, we teach kids about like the um, anatomy and physiology. So we teach them like where their biceps, where their quads are. So like, obviously by the end of like an eight week course, we plan on having like, all the kids, whether they're like one and two, be able to at least point to where like their quad is, or their bicep. Um, so we go into like daycares and different things like that. And we help just kids. And we also help teachers just relax and, and give them like a quick like hour break instead of spending from 
8 a.m. until 4 p.m. with these kids all day. Oh, my God. My lady right now could use y'all up at the pre-K <laughs> where she works at. Because those kids, I, I call on the phone, those kids be driving her crazy. She was like, it's crazy. Just, and it's just like a 45-minute break where you can just relax yep. and just, like, like mentally just decompress. And, like, a lot of teachers really like it because it's us handling. Like, we bring all the equipment. We bring everything there. We do, like, stamp stickers and bubbles. Like, you know what I mean? We really make an engagement where the kids actually have fun. We trick them into doing push-ups and sit-ups. So we'll be like, all right, guys, yeah. everyone's going to lay down. Okay, now everyone get up. Okay, now lay down. Now get up. And it teaches them how to do sit-ups and just different things like that. They're like, if you said, hey, we're going to do a push-up or a sit-up, they'd be like, I don't want to do that. Right. Yeah. So, it's ways just to trick them. So it's a pretty um, unique idea. And uh, I actually had my first demo day today. I, I, I just opened January 1 in Orlando. So um, just got back, was connecting. So we have our first demo day. So definitely excited for that. Man, good luck with that, boss. That's that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I tell them definitely going to tell my girl, tell my lady to tap me into that. We might, they might have to hire y'all to bring y'all up here to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, man. <laughs> Real talk because yeah, those, I, I know, know. I mean, everything no, they, around they, they here. Do. A lot of kids yeah, don't yeah. have physical activity like and, like, we even try to teach them, like, gross mo motor skills. So, like, we'll have, like, um, cones and angles. So, we'll teach them, like, run and stick, run and stick, just so their body is used to, like, moving like that. Because I have a lot of kids, I get them, they're 12, 13, and, like, I'm like, all right, let's do a high knee. What's a high knee? Let's do a butt kick. What's a butt kick? Mm -hmm. You know, and, like, they don't know, like, basically stuff. I mean, when I was, like, eight years old, I knew what all that was. Yeah. You know, I, I was yeah. going to football practice. And it's, like, yeah. some of these kids don't know. And so, like, whenever they get older and they say, hey, I want to play a sport, they're not confident because they were never taught any type of motor skills. And they see all these people that have been having private training and learning and this and that. And then they, they're just not confident in themselves. And, and for me being a quarterback, like if you're going to be good at any sport, no matter what it is, you have to be confident in yourself because if you're not, then like you're not going to be able to produce the way you want to um, produce. Man, so. Thanks. 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 Right. Man, that's good, man. That's, that's dope. That's dope, man. <laughs> so, that's dope. So, so right now, so right, so right now this uh pretty, I mean, if you want to give a, you know, said Brad, this this pretty much what you're doing right now with your uh with your company that you just launched on January first. That in the uh, QB, the coach in the QB. Yeah. So we're doing that, and then I um I'm actually in the process of uh, launching an NFT project with a couple of business partners. So that's that's definitely been in the works. Um, it's going to be an interesting project, which I'm 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 not going to reveal yet. But yeah, um, our, yeah, our project's going to be lit. We got a lot of <laughs> a lot of people involved in it. And Tap in with me. Tap in with me. Yeah, it's going to be lit. Like some of the stuff that like they told us that they can do now with NFTs absolutely blew my mind. It's just they have like ways to dynamically change the NFT based on like in real life action, if that makes Man, that's sense. That's crazy. That's so crazy. So based yeah, on yeah, what's yeah, going yeah. on in the real world, your NFT will change whether it's like his hat changes or his chain changes. And so like some of the dynamics they have are crazy. So the way that we're integrated with with our NFT project is going to be a lot of fun. So Man, that's crazy. I just saw, I just saw Odell Beckham uh, said he got the rounds to pay him in crypto. And yeah, he dropped his uh, he dropped his little cyberpunk shirt yesterday. He wore it to a warm up uh, yeah. at, the, at the game. That's I said that it's crazy like how the world it, evolving. It's just rolling, you know? yeah, and it's it's, it's going to get bigger and bigger because you're going to see more companies invest into like the metaverse, which is which is what's going to push more money into crypto because the only way to purchase stuff in the metaverse is through like cryptocurrencies, different things like that. So that's yeah. that that's the real push. Like if you get in early now and you see, hey, if I hang on to this for the next ten years, not a, a one year flip then you'll see your thing like five to 10 X just because more and more companies are getting involved into like this type of digital web three stuff. Yes, sir. So, sorry about that. All right, you good, baby. Good. You good. B, you got anything, anything left, baby? No, 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 that's it. That's it. Okay, man. Man, bro, we, bro, we appreciate this, man. We appreciate this interview, bro. I mean, yeah. just giving the insights and everything that you're doing, bro. I'm intrigued, bro. I'm definitely going to be tapping in, you know what I'm saying, to you and, and uh, and trying to you know say express about your, your your company and everything about everything that's going on, bro. I appreciate you, man. God bless you and your companies, man. Everything that you're doing. I got I got a, I got a I got a up and coming quarterback coming up. I'm gonna send them down there to you. <laughs> My bonus <Okay>. son. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Send you, wait, you said you're in Alabama. You said you're in Alabama. Yeah, yeah, I'm in Alabama. I'm in uh, I'm in Tuscaloosa. I'm in Tuscaloosa. We got we got three sites in Alabama. So okay. They good too. Oh, we got uh, <laughs> Mobile, Birmingham, and Huntsville, and then we have two in Tennessee. So like okay. any one of those. So they're all around oh, you. Yeah. Um, I'm, you I'm 30 to, minutes from Birmingham. So yeah, yes, sir. So you just go to QBCountry.com, and actually, the guy that's at Birmingham is David Morris, his right hand man. So I mean, honestly, like he's one of the best in the business, at least from like in, in, inside of our business. He's really good. Knows what he's talking about. He's developed plenty of kids. He actually does. Um, 
you know Devlin Hodges, the kid that's with the Steelers. Yeah, so in the yeah. offseason, Devlin, Devlin comes back all the time. So like if, if you ever go to an offseason, like you'll see Devlin up there a lot. Um, so he has some NFL guys, probably has more than just Devlin. I think he has like two or three, and he has a whole bunch of like underclassmen which are which are going to be successful. So definitely want to get you tapped in with that guy, Birmingham. Oh, indeed, indeed, man. I appreciate I appreciate the information, man. I, and again, again, you know what I'm saying? For me, for me, I know being offended, but for me, bro, I appreciate you coming on, taking the time. Come on to our show, bro. We up and coming, man. I'm just glad you are you are uh, second guest, bro. I'm just glad you came on for it, bro. It's gonna be a, a great show for people to tune into. Then people to know what you got going on now, man. All right, perfect. Yeah, appreciate you. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank yeah, like LeBron said, thank you very much. You know, it means everything to to bring you on and then we'll definitely next next season uh or maybe even the summer try to bring you on to talk a little bit more miami football once that kind of gets in and then you can bring up you know as you, how your company's going and how all that's going all right perfect yeah that because because that'll give me a lot of time too so i don't know if you guys know but i actually trained tyler van dyke the quarterback at Miami. okay so okay. yeah we're gonna get together at the end of the month and, and we're gonna start doing some off-season stuff so that'll be some stuff too that like i'll give you some insight on tyler and how he's doing oh, yeah. okay yeah yeah that would be yeah that'd be great damn yeah, shoot yeah, yeah, but it'll be but it'll be basic stuff though it won't be anything crazy obviously because yeah. i can't you know, but <laughs> nah, like, yeah well, at least, you know, yeah, we know we know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but hey, if he play, if he if he ball out, be ACC Player of the Year, man, you got something to do with that. Yeah, I mean, I think he won. <laughs> I I know he won multiple rookies of 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 the week. So I mean, he balled out. So definitely gonna see yeah. it going. And I mean, he's just gonna grow. Like I'm definitely excited to see him because as good as he did, he's just gonna get ten times better, man. And 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 that's like the biggest thing I preach to him is stay humble, just because just know like you're about to just get better. So this is just like yeah. a starting point for Tyler Van Dyke. So I'm definitely. <laughs> excited to see him grow and, and, and just keep getting better and become an NFL quarterback. Indeed, so, man. It's it just, it just, it just uh, amazing, bro. Just, I, I can tell in your voice, bro, you love what you do. You no, know I what I'm saying? Like teaching the yeah, quarterback, love you love it. what you do, man. And like just hearing that passion. I know I'm just passionate about, you know what I'm saying, the game also just to hear from, you know what I'm saying, another former player, you know what I'm saying, to hearing about it. Now you're taking it to the coaching, man. Salute to you, bro. Like Appreciate real talk. You, Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you for everything, man. No problem.